Nancy Hamilton was a busy young woman, deeply immersed in two tasks simultaneously. Kneeling in front of her employer's desk, Nancy combined her duties. However, it wasn't her employer, David Ferris, who occupied the chair, but the charming Libby Fielding, a work colleague. Meanwhile, Nancy passionately satisfied her colleagues' desires with her tongue and fingers. Concurrently, Nancy was tasked with responding to David Ferris's thrusts as he stood behind her. This trio had been engaged in their activities for quite some time. Nancy and Libby alternated positions, causing their boss considerable distress. Watching from an empty office, Willis Hamilton, a man with a worried look, captured the scene with his camera lens. His discomfort stemmed from the fact that Nancy, the main character of the scene, had been his wife for almost three years. I had known Nancy Hillis for quite a while. We attended the same high school, although I was two grades ahead of her. Despite the age gap, I admired the charming redhead, but our social circles didn't intersect, so we hadn't formally met. She excelled in athletics, particularly basketball and softball, while I preferred spectating various sports rather than participating actively. Although I engaged in run in calisthenics for health and aesthetic reasons, my interests leaned more towards the artistic side. I found joy in paintings and sculptures, but my true passion lay in photography. I had started practicing photography at a young age, prompted by an aunt who shared the same passion and gifted me a well-used 35mm camera. She taught me the ins and outs of developing film, and I quickly took to it. By the time I finished high school, I was already earning money by taking family portraits, children's photos, and capturing babies' first moments in a makeshift studio at home. I reinvested all my earnings into the business, eventually establishing my own studio with a comfortable apartment upstairs and an attached darkroom. After two years of hard work building my business, I decided to enroll in community college. I wanted to master the emerging digital photography techniques that were shaping the future of the industry. Digital photography offered numerous advantages, and I quickly adapted to the new technology. It was in this new academic setting that two significant events combined to dramatically alter my life. Initially, a familiar presence graced the college that semester, Nancy Hillis. She enrolled in business courses to support her role in her father's store. I couldn't help but notice her enhanced beauty, now taller and more voluptuous, boasting those tantalizingly long, well-formed legs. With fiery red hair, emerald green eyes, and flawless creamy skin, she exuded the aura of a contemporary Celtic goddess. Despite my strong desire to ask her out, my courage faltered. While I discovered she didn't have a steady boyfriend through casual conversation, I struggled to muster the bravery to make a move. However, a class assignment provided the catalyst. I was tasked with a quintessential element of visual media, a nude. The concept swiftly crystallized in my mind, requiring only the perfect model, Nancy Hillis. I envisioned a black and white composition with nuanced lighting, highlighting her smooth cream-colored skin. With meticulous planning, the right camera, and adept Photoshop skills, her skin would radiate like a new moon. Coupled with the interplay of light and shadow accentuating her timeless beauty, it promised to be a masterpiece worthy of top marks. Moreover, orchestrating the photoshoot presented an opportunity to forge a connection and perhaps kindle a romance. However, two obstacles loomed large, persuading her to model without seeming like a creepy voyeur and summoning the courage to approach her in the first place. Everything went smoothly, despite my nerves being akin to a cat with a long tail in a room full of rocking chairs. She later admitted to feeling flattered by my attention and entertained by my unease. So entertained, in fact, that she feigned outrage and verbally attacked me just to witness me squirm further. When I confessed that my request for the photo pose was genuine and that I was genuinely attracted to her, she seemed almost melted. As often happens in such situations, it turned out she was interested in me all along, waiting for me to make a move. The following Friday night doubled as both the photo shoot and our first date. The evening culminated in deeply satisfying lovemaking, sparking the beginning of our romance. Within a year, we had progressed to the ultimate level, tying the knot in an intimate ceremony with our close friends and family present. I was ecstatically happy with Nancy, and she reciprocated my passion equally. 
we adored each other's parents, prioritized time together outside of work, and maintained a loving and romantic connection. Our financial decisions were prudent, and we ensured that our sexual relationship was abundant and mutually fulfilling. Ironically, it was in the realm of sex that issues arose. I confess to being old-fashioned, a hopeless romantic whose sexual desires reflect that aspect of my personality. I believe in cherishing any woman, especially my wife, as a precious gem. To meaning or disrespecting her in any way is simply not in my nature. Nancy, on the other hand, was more adventurous, a humorous reversal of roles, perhaps. I endeavored to be receptive to her suggestions. The provocative lingerie she chose was very appealing to me. I enjoyed pleasuring her intimately, so I fully supported her decision to shave. Her delicate, strawberry-colored, intimate area was naturally beautiful and didn't require any embellishment. Nancy, with her alluring legs, preferred wearing skirts and dresses, keeping them modest in length publicly, yet privately we shared a passionate secret. She favored garter belts and stockings with the occasional scandalous crotchless pantyhose, which excited me greatly. Knowing she wore nothing underneath her attire except those items heightened my anticipation during our outings. When she brought home a book on exotic sex positions, we eagerly ventured into experimentation. I indulged her fondness for being restrained, which she thoroughly enjoyed. Although I found pleasure in tickling her, she was incredibly ticklish and couldn't endure much, particularly on the soles of her feet. However, her persistent desire to push boundaries troubled me. While I made an effort to engage in activities like watching pornography together, it didn't resonate with me as it did with her. For me, intimacy between a husband and wife was an expression of love, not merely carnal desire. I wasn't opposed to exploring new things within our relationship as long as it was consensual and enjoyable for both of us. Yet, her newfound interests seemed to introduce an external force into our partnership. The idea of role-playing came up, and although it wasn't my preference, I tried to accommodate her wishes. However, I drew a firm line at involving others in our marital bed. While I was open to pretending to be different characters in our fantasies, I objected to bringing real individuals into our intimate space. This disagreement escalated when it came to my part-time assistant, Carrie Wilson. I occasionally had to leave the studio for business reasons, particularly on picture days at various county schools. During these times, I would take the standard class photos used in yearbooks and packets sent home to friends and family. While this was a lucrative source of income that couldn't be ignored, it came with a cost, leaving the studio unattended. To address this issue, I reached out to my former professor for a recommendation of a capable part-time worker among his current students. Carrie was highly recommended and subsequently hired. Carrie possessed a rare beauty that she seemed oblivious to, despite constant affirmations. She was undeniably stunning, standing just shy of five feet tall, but appearing taller due to her well-proportioned legs. With a curvaceous figure that was neither excessive nor lacking, she exuded natural allure. Her long, thick, corn-silk blonde hair framed her tanned and smooth skin, hinting at her outdoor lifestyle. Her frosty blue eyes and striking face needed little enhancement, typically requiring no more than a touch of lip gloss and occasionally some eyeliner and lipstick on heavier days. That was all she needed to accentuate her beauty. Her character radiated beauty just as much as her physical appearance did. She possessed an innate charm that made conversing with her effortless, spanning a wide array of topics. Morally upright yet non-judgmental, she offered sound advice with a clear mind. Once she gave her loyalty, it was unwavering. What stood out most to me was her remarkable affinity with children and infants, a trait particularly valuable given my line of work. While I had a knack for handling them, she surpassed me by far, as they adored her just as much as she adored them. I often invited her to the studio, especially on days with many babies, teasing her about potentially having a large family one day. She excelled at her job, and shared my enthusiasm for both the technical and artistic aspects of our work. Despite her undeniable attractiveness, I refrained from entertaining any inappropriate thoughts about her out of respect. She was astute and would have noticed any lapse in my demeanor, leading to unnecessary guilt, so I maintained a strictly professional attitude. One evening, after a few too many glasses of wine,
Things took an uncomfortable turn when Nancy suggested role-playing as someone else. I objected vehemently, feeling hurt by the implication that she desired another man, even if only in fantasy. Perhaps I'm overly sentimental, but I cherish traditional romantic ideals. We eventually resolved the issue, or so I thought. If Nancy continued to indulge in fantasies, she kept them hidden from me. Unfortunately, truth has a way of dispelling ignorance, regardless of how blissful it may seem. As I mentioned earlier, things only approved after that night. We were passionately intimate, exploring new avenues of pleasure together. She introduced me to foot fetishes, something she had read about, and I found myself enjoying it, particularly because it excited her so much. Honestly, she had an incredibly sexy pair of feet, especially enchanting when adorned with stockings. I was surprised by her ingenuity, discovering she could pleasure me using just her feet, albeit after a bit of playful coercion to worship them. In the following weeks, our intimacy intensified. We made love nearly every night, with weekends being particularly adventurous. I was exhausted but content. Nancy had always been an exceptional lover, and her desire for me only fueled my pride. I made sure to express my love for her daily through words, gestures, and frequent gifts. Despite both working, I contributed to household chores and cooking. It felt like bliss. I had a thriving business, a wonderful marriage, and an electrifying sex life. Suddenly, everything changed. When she returned home from work one Monday, she was a different person. It took almost a week before we were intimate again. She claimed to be unwell. However, it wasn't just about sex. There was a lack of affection, minimal touching, and she didn't use her usual terms of endearment. It felt as though her mind was elsewhere. Even when we resumed intimacy, it didn't feel the same. It was like a flawed imitation of what it used to be. I had a suspicion, but I pushed it away. I convinced myself that she wasn't capable of such behavior. In reality, I just couldn't bear the thought of what it would mean if my suspicions were true. Despite asking her multiple times if something was wrong, she always reassured me that she just had a lot on her mind and that everything would be fine. However, I wasn't as optimistic. Months later, the truth hit me almost like a physical blow. As I attempted to pleasure her orally, I noticed it. I immediately rushed to the bathroom and vomited. There on the delicate skin near her labia, was a faint yet unmistakable mark of passion, as if someone had claimed her. The problem was glaringly obvious. I certainly hadn't left that mark. I couldn't be certain whether it was deliberate or not. Nancy's skin was prone to marking easily, even without much effort. Whether it was intentional or not, the message was clear. At that point, intent no longer mattered. Her response upon my emergence from the bathroom spoke volumes. Upon mentioning my suspicion of a stomach virus and suggesting we postpone our plans for another night, her visible relief was unmistakable. Suddenly, everything clicked into place. As I lay there for the remainder of the night, I felt my world crumbling around me. I knew I needed answers and was unwilling to tolerate such betrayal. Thankfully, we hadn't progressed too far into our relationship and there were no children involved, for which I was grateful. My first priority was to safeguard my business and reputation. I needed guidance and I knew exactly whose shoulder I could lean on. The following morning, after Nancy had departed for work, I reached out to Carrie and requested her presence at the studio. With no classes scheduled for the week, she agreed to come without hesitation. I purposely withheld any indication of the true reason for my summons, intending to address the situation with her face to face rather than over the phone. Goodness will, she exclaimed upon hearing my recount of the troubling details. Are you absolutely certain about all of this? Perhaps she's just preoccupied with something serious. Maybe what you saw was simply a bruise. Oh, how I wish that were the case, I replied wearily to Carrie. It's not just the physical mark, and I'm positive it wasn't a bruise. What's truly troubling is that every piece of evidence so far leads to one stark conclusion. Let's lay it all out and examine why I'm feeling suspicious. Firstly, there's her changing sexual desires. She was enthusiastic about exploring new experiences, but suddenly that desire vanished, never to be mentioned again. Then she approached me as if starved for intimacy. For weeks, she overwhelmed me with affection. 
introducing me to various sexual ideas she claimed to have read about. But just as quickly, our intimate life came to a halt. While it's revived somewhat in recent months, it feels different, as if she's merely going through the motions. Considering all of that, along with the passion mark, the outlook isn't favorable for me, Carrie. It's certainly concerning. Carrie agreed, her eyes reflecting sadness as she looked at me. But I still believe you should proceed with caution. Where does she spend her time outside of work? That's the puzzling part, Carrie, I responded. She rarely goes out alone after work. We're almost always together. Occasionally, she visits her parents solo, but I doubt she's being dishonest there. It would be easy to verify if her story didn't add up. She does see friends occasionally, but not regularly. So if there's anything amiss, it's likely happening during the day. I have an idea, Carrie said, rising to pace around the room. Why don't I discreetly follow her and observe her during the day for a while? That way, if she's going somewhere, perhaps during her lunch break, I'll find out. If you're willing to do that, then I agree, I said, but I insist on compensating you for your time and expenses. I won't entertain any objections on that matter. It's non-negotiable. Carrie faithfully followed Nancy throughout the day, noticing that Nancy never left the building for anything unusual. Occasionally, she would step out to pick up lunch, presumably for more than just herself given the quantity of food. Considering Carrie's role as a personal assistant to an executive, she wondered if the food was for her and her boss. It was then that a realization struck me suddenly. Carrie, I have a sinking feeling, I expressed with a sigh. Perhaps Nancy's assistance extends far beyond the typical duties, possibly necessitating her constant presence within the building. Maybe it's time for me to take over surveillance while you manage the studio. I know which floor she works on, and her office boasts floor-to-ceiling windows. I could potentially set up across the street and observe. Nancy mentioned her boss has a bedroom and bath in the suite. If they spend an unusual amount of time there, it could provide a clue to what's amiss. While I may not capture every detail, it's crucial for me to uncover the truth. I don't want you to witness any potential betrayal. I'm prepared to face the reality. If she's deceiving me, I need to see it firsthand. I won't resort to physical harm, but I'll confront her with the full force of my disappointment. Just refrain from any foolish actions, Will, Carrie cautioned, gazing into my eyes while clasping my hands. Living well is the ultimate retaliation. Life operates in cycles. What goes around comes around. I assure you, little lady, I replied with a smile that was somewhat forced. It would be dreadful to have our conversations behind bulletproof glass with me dressed in orange pajamas. Luck was on my side. I managed to secure an empty office directly across the street. With my camera mounted on a tripod and equipped with a telephoto lens capable of capturing even the tiniest detail, I settled in to wait. It didn't take long. These individuals were either recklessly ignorant, incredibly arrogant, or perhaps a blend of both. On the first day, my view was limited because most of the activity occurred in the bedroom. Trust me, there was plenty happening in the main office to make it clear they weren't playing cards back there. It wasn't just my wife and her boss involved. I had heard my wife mention the receptionist, Libby Fielding, whom she had described as promiscuous and possibly bisexual. Well, surprise. Turns out my wife shared those inclinations too, and promiscuous might not even be a strong enough word for either of them. However, their bisexuality was undeniable. On the second day, I struck gold. Everything unfolded right behind the boss's desk in full view, and I captured it all on camera. A digital camera's memory card can hold a wealth of painful memories, let me tell you. Strangely, my emotional response was different from what I anticipated. I was angry and hurt, certainly. Disgust and contempt filled me. But there was no arousal. Not a single tear fell, though my eyes welled up momentarily. Instead, I felt numb. Perhaps because deep down I already knew what I would uncover. One thing was clear. I was consumed by a burning desire to inflict the same pain on all three of them that I was feeling. Step one involved duplicating all those incriminating photographs. One set was promptly secured in a safety deposit box rented by Carrie. I kept the remaining copies in a secure location and began strategizing the impending chaos. I had to approach this intelligently, 
My aim was to bring down the three individuals like a force of nature, but my own well-being took priority. When I eventually administered retribution, it needed to be meticulously planned. I aimed to orchestrate the events like maneuvers on a chessboard. Inflicting maximum damage upon them was crucial, but minimizing any repercussions on myself was even more imperative. Drawing from lessons taught by my father, a former active duty Marine, reconnaissance was paramount before launching any attack. While I was familiar with one of these individuals, clearly not as well as I had presumed, the other two, particularly King Big Dick, required careful scrutiny. I sought to identify weaknesses in their defenses and anticipate their reactions under pressure to ensure I stayed ahead of the game. When I delved into Libby Fielding's background, I unearthed some intriguing details. Her father, a long-haul trucker, hailed from a tough lineage of four brothers known for their no-nonsense approach to life. They were the kind who settled scores through feuds, and crossing them could spell trouble for anyone involved. It dawned on me that Mr. Fielding wouldn't likely tolerate any encroachment on his marriage territory. This presented a leverage point I hadn't considered before, one that could potentially give me significant control over Big Deck. As for my impending divorce proceedings, the legal aspect was straightforward. In Virginia, divorce entailed dividing communal assets, but she would be left with nothing substantial beyond her personal belongings and car. She had a good income. Let her rebuild her life. Initially, I intended to keep everything, but I decided to compromise and offer her half of our savings and checking accounts. There was no credit card debt since we paid it off monthly. It wasn't about generosity. I had plans for a secret windfall she wouldn't be entitled to. Sacrificing a small portion of my assets wouldn't affect me much. With the leverage I held over her, she'd comply. As for the windfall, pursuing a public alienation of affection lawsuit seemed impractical and messy. Instead, I'd opted for a more strategic approach. Three precise strikes rather than one explosive retaliation. The first shot of the conflict was fired shortly after the slut departed for work the following day. Swiftly, I'd managed to pack her belongings, have them boxed, and sent off to the storage center. Locks on all doors were promptly changed by a hired individual. Subsequently, I attended to matters concerning our joint checking and savings accounts, transitioned the credit card under my name, altered the beneficiary on my life insurance, and revised my will accordingly. For precautionary measures, I arranged to undergo STD testing through my preferred medical provider. Following this, I made my way to Mr. David Ferris' office suite, hoping for fortuitous timing, which indeed favored me. As my wife exited the premises at the end of the workday, I discreetly made my way to Mr. Ferris's office without her noticing me. Mrs. Fielding, occupied with her own tasks, was unaware as I confidently strode past her towards the office door, taking a seat in front of Mr. Ferris without hesitation, ready to address matters at hand. Who the hell do you think you are? He inquired, his face twisted in confusion. I'm Willis Hamilton. I declared, flashing a grin akin to that of a shark, and if you've got any sense you'll sit tight, listen up, and keep your trap shut until I give you the cue to speak. Strangely enough, he complied. Though the urge to speak was evident, I could see the cogs turning in his mind as he pondered what I knew, how I knew it, and whether I could substantiate it beyond his ability to deny. It seemed he opted to let the scenario unfold, to gauge my stance, before resorting to physical force and summoning security. Now listen up, I started, retrieving an envelope from my briefcase. There are some rather intriguing photographs in here. Caught your. Well, now that I think of it, you don't exactly have a flattering side. Neither does your receptionist, nor my unfaithful wife for that matter. Right, he retorted with a venomous tone and a look of disdain. So you've somehow obtained compromising photos of me with the staff but it strikes me that they might be more embarrassing for you than for me. People might start questioning your ability to manage things at home. As for me, they'll likely commend me for handling two attractive women at once. Let's not even broach the invasion of privacy angle here. Are you kidding me? I exclaimed, incredulous. How on earth did someone as foolish as you manage to become wealthy? First, you're engaging in affairs with two married women right in plain view of everyone. It's as if you were selling tickets, you arrogant fool. Secondly, do you really think I'll be the one feeling embarrassed in this situation? 
I'm a self-made businessman in this town, known for my hard work and moral integrity. I don't indulge in excessive drinking, drugs, or infidelity. Even her own family and friends can attest to how well I've treated her. She'll be exposed for the deceitful person she is, while people will sympathize with me. Women will be lining up to console me. As for you, you'll be the epitome of low-life scum in this town. How do you think your business contacts will view this? Let me give you a hint. Radioactive. Remember, this is a relatively small town with traditional values. Incidents like this don't go unnoticed here, unlike in larger cities like New York or Los Angeles. I doubt you'll be welcomed in social circles anymore. Your presence is already straining things as it is. You're certainly no Donald Trump with your earrings, tattoos, and Harley. Your next concern should be Mr. Fielding and the rest of his family. I strongly suspect they won't resort to legal action over these photos. You might want to invest in a bulletproof vehicle and a security team to replace that Harley. In summary, Mr. Ferris, I have you firmly in my grasp. Oh, pardon me. I see from the photographic evidence that you don't have any firm grasp. Let's change short hairs to balls. I have two questions, he said, looking like he just found a fly in his soup. How much will it cost to keep these pictures from seeing the light of day? And how can I trust you not to leak them anyway? David, in reality, your consequences won't be too severe, I remarked, flashing a smirk. As someone who appreciates art, I'm feeling inclined towards poetic justice today. You've effectively disrupted a nearly three-year-old marriage, so to answer your initial inquiry, that amounts to three million dollars. While significant to me, it's a trifling sum for a big spender like yourself. Among those photographs is the information for an offshore account. If the funds are deposited into the set account by 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, you'll receive the second and final set of pictures. Naturally, with the exception of a set safeguarded in a secure location in case of any suspicious incidents leading to my unfortunate demise. Consider yourself fortunate that Nancy and I weren't together for a decade or two. Another matter, David. Those images will also be used to enforce a non-disclosure agreement. The exchange of the three million remains strictly between us. You mustn't breathe a word, especially not to Nancy. If she attempts to claim it in a divorce settlement, those pictures will surface. She also retains her job. I refuse to pay alimony to a woman who cheats on me. As for your second question, realistically, you're in the dark. You'll simply have to trust me on that front. Ultimately, I've come out ahead in this situation. I've rid myself of an unfaithful partner. You're stuck with her, and I've secured a $3 million fund for vacations and retirement. I've gained what I needed from you. There's no need for further antagonism. You may feel unfairly treated in your current predicament, but I must remind you that had you exercised restraint with your considerable anatomy, you wouldn't find yourself in this dilemma. As the saying goes, God gave man a brain and a dick, and only enough blood to supply one of them at a time. You clearly chose poorly. And now it's time to face the music. There's another matter we must address. I can tell just by looking at you that you might feel inclined to resort to violence against me. I want to give you a heads up, a little cautionary note. I have another interest, though I haven't indulged in it much since I got married. You see, my father and I enjoy shooting, and he being a former Marine, taught me well. I'm confident I can maintain tight groupings with my firearm at a respectable distance. I own a 1911 Colt with a concealed carry permit. She's quite exquisite, nickel-plated with ivory grips, equipped with a match-grade barrel, chamber, trigger, and adjustable combat sights with tritium inserts. Her feed system is polished to prevent jamming with the jacketed hollow points I prefer to use. Speaking of which, while jacketed hollow points are generally undesirable, 45 ACP hollow points create quite a mess. Even someone as sizable as yourself wouldn't fare well after taking a couple of those to the center mass. Should you choose to approach me after our discussion tonight, I will not hesitate to defend myself. You may be physically larger than me, but thanks to Colonel Colt and John Browning, we're all on equal footing. My philosophy is simple. It's better to face a trial than to be carried to my grave. Consider yourself warned, Mr. Ferris. Have a pleasant evening, sir.
As I left the office, I couldn't help but draw a parallel between my situation and General Grant's conquest of Richmond. Glancing at my cell phone, which I had silenced while confronting the formidable David Ferris, I noticed numerous missed calls from my wife. Though I wasn't quite prepared to address her concerns, I understood the need to offer her some reassurance for the time being. With a sigh, I dialed her number. Hello, dear. It's me. What's on your mind? Will, something's wrong. My key won't work. I can't get into the studio or the apartment. I'm aware, Nancy. The locks have been changed. You might consider staying at your parents' place tonight. But Will, darling, I need clothes for work tomorrow. And why can't I stay with you? Because, my dear, you're no longer welcome at my place. Your belongings, including your clothes, are in storage under your name. You can pick them up tonight. Take your dad's pickup. It won't cost you anything. Let's not play games. I'd appreciate it if you don't contact me further tonight. We'll meet tomorrow at Roscoe's for lunch to discuss our situation. There was a sharp intake of breath before the line went dead. She chose to respect my request. Surprisingly, I slept soundly that night, free from worry. The following morning, I waited until 10.30 to check if David had decided to cooperate. The money had indeed been transferred into the account. I suppose he concluded it was a reasonable deal to avoid a troublesome situation that would tarnish his reputation and might ultimately cost him more in the long term. Without delay, I moved the money again to ensure no traces were left behind. A wide smile spread across my face. I had managed to exact at least one out of three pounds of retribution. Now, regardless of the outcome with Nancy, I was secure. Though I wasn't keen on the idea, I could relocate to another city and start afresh if necessary. However, the thought of leaving behind my friends and family here made it less appealing. If anyone had to move, let it be them. I arrived at Roscoe's at the agreed time, ordered an iced tea and a serving of beer-battered onion rings, and settled in to await Nancy. If she had the courage to appear, I was prepared to put an end to this charade of a marriage. She arrived looking flustered and unwell. She declined my offer of food, opting for coffee instead. I must admit her choice gave me a small sense of triumph. Clearly all was not well in Nancy's world. Throughout our conversation, she struggled to meet my gaze. I apologize, Will, she began with a hesitant voice and lowered gaze. I anticipated this moment. It's my responsibility primarily. It's not because of anything you did or didn't do. I destroyed my own happiness with my own foolish actions. Nancy, I need to understand, I gently inquired, attempting to meet her eyes. What happened? I know I'm far from perfect, but I love you more than anything. I would have given my life for you. I did everything in my power to make you happy. Sadly, I thought you were content. It's a familiar tale. Will, she sighed sadly, glancing down at her hands clasped in her lap. I was ecstatic with you. But somewhere along the line, I grew dissatisfied. I wanted more. I tried convincing myself that I didn't truly desire an affair with David. Yet looking at it objectively, he did take advantage of me the first time. But that reasoning doesn't hold up. I was flirting with him boldly. The thrill I got from that flirtation I brought back to you, justifying it in my mind. What I realize now, too late, is that it was always about me and David from the beginning. David saw through my facade. He understood my true desires and chose to confront the situation directly. Looking back at that day and the subsequent events over the months, he clearly demonstrated a greater sense of self-awareness than I did. The truth is evident now, albeit painful. While I lacked the power to initially prevent what occurred, I must accept responsibility for putting myself in that situation. Although it was thrilling and forbidden, I could have chosen to halt it albeit with some lingering guilt. However, I continued to engage in it repeatedly driven by my enjoyment. I was fully aware of the immorality of my actions, indulging in behaviors that repulsed me and others, yet I persisted in repeating them. The true tragedy lies not in the acts themselves, but in my unwavering enjoyment of them. No, that's not accurate at all. The most terrible aspect is that I was fully aware that my actions would cause pain to those who cared about me, you, my parents, my genuine friends.
I knew that eventually you would all discover what I had done. Recognizing this, understanding that I would ultimately inflict hurt and shame upon the people I love, and yet still selfishly indulging in my destructive desires, reveals to me in the harsh light of reality, the monster I have become. God help me. Well, Nancy, I'm at least relieved that you've come to this realization. Unfortunately, like many in your situation, this insight has come too late, only after you've been caught. I understand, Will, she now appeared utterly despondent, tears streaming down her cheeks. I can't defend my actions, but, and I suspect I already know the answer, is there any chance for us? I'll do anything. I'm already seeking professional help. I've confessed everything to my parents, though it devastated them. I don't love David. I still believe that with counseling, we can salvage this. I still envision a future with you, having our children, growing old together. It may be hard to believe, but I truly love you, Will. Oh, Nancy, now it was my turn to look down, shaking my head as tears welled up. I prayed before coming here today, knowing I might hear things I didn't want to. I pleaded for mercy from God. I prayed you wouldn't say what you just did. Do you really love me? I highly doubt it. Nancy, the bottom line is that somewhere along the way, you've lost the ability to love anyone other than yourself. Your own words incriminate you. You knew that this truth would surface eventually. You were fully aware of how much it would hurt those who care about you when it came out. But that didn't stop you. That's not love, darling. Frankly, I wouldn't even entertain the idea of being intimate with another woman in our bed, even if you gave me permission. Why? Because my love for you wouldn't allow me to betray you, not even in my thoughts. Now let's think about something else your selfishness led you to overlook. You've been having unprotected sex with not just one, but two people. For months. Well, at least two that I know of. What if David or Libby has infected you with HIV? Then I'm facing a death sentence right now. I went for testing yesterday. Until I get the results, I have this looming over me, along with dealing with all this mess. For heaven's sake, Nancy, do you honestly believe you're the only one they're sleeping with? It's common sense that Libby's married. She's probably sleeping with her husband at the very least. What if he's seeking other partners while he's away? He's bringing that back home to her. She's passing it on to you and David, and then you're bringing it to me. And that's not even considering any other potential partners David might have. Essentially, you've been forcing me into unprotected encounters with David, with Libby, and with anyone else they're involved with. Listen, I won't insult your intelligence by saying I don't love you anymore. I'm deeply hurt and angry right now. But a part of me acknowledges that there will always be some love for you buried deep inside. But here's the crucial difference. Because of your actions, I'm no longer in love with you. There's a significant distinction between the two. Now let's address the other major issue here. I can't erase the images from my mind of watching you with those two other people. It's clear I wasn't involved and wasn't even given the chance to be. You took something that belonged to me and shared it with others. I'll keep replaying that scene in my head to some extent until the end of my days. No matter what, those mental images won't disappear. Even if I could suppress them and stay with you, I'd be resentful. I'd always doubt if I could truly satisfy you again, regardless of your reassurances. Every time you experience pleasure, I'd wonder if it's genuine. During our intimate moments, I'd question if it's really me you're loving or someone else. Those images would invalidate your claims. It would be a psychological nightmare. Do I even need to mention that I should never have been put in this situation in the first place? Here's one final consideration. How can I ever trust you again? After you disregarded our relationship so selfishly? What assurance do I have that I won't disappoint you again, leading you to seek comfort elsewhere? And how can I be certain that you'll fulfill your promises and obligations? Should I resort to monitoring you with an ankle bracelet? However justified my suspicions may be, they would inevitably strain our relationship. Bringing children into such an environment of distrust and resentment is unimaginable. So here's the plan. Virginia operates as a no-fault state or technically a commonwealth. We'll file citing irreconcilable differences. Our checking and savings accounts will be split evenly. The apartment and studio were mine prior to our marriage and are essential for my livelihood. 
so I'll retain ownership. You'll take all your belongings and your car. My lawyer suggests that if these terms work for you, we can proceed with a single attorney. In six months, it'll all be finalized. As a gesture of the remaining love I have for you, I'm willing to cover half of the legal expenses. However, if you oppose me, things could get messy. I have no intention of tarnishing your reputation, but I do have evidence of your workplace affair which could be damaging. I'll make sure everyone important to you in this town sees those photos, so it's best not to challenge me. Right now, I'm not the same person you married. There's a darker side that you've brought out. Let's end this amicably and move on with our lives separately. Perhaps with time we can become friends again, or maybe more, but the divorce is inevitable. I need time to heal, and then we can see what the future holds. Regrettably, Nancy uttered amidst her bitter tears, I see no alternative but to comply with your desires. Please inform me of the appointment with the attorney, and I will sign whatever documents you require. It's crucial for you to understand that I'll begin searching for a new job promptly. Understandably, I find it unbearable to be around David and Libby now. I also hope that with time, you'll find it in your heart to forgive my grievous betrayal of a decent man whose love I could never match. I approached her and embraced her tightly as she clung to me, crying uncontrollably on my shoulder. I don't feel the need to apologize for comforting her in that moment. Tears fell from my own eyes as well. I wept for the loss of a love that once felt so pure and promising, now tarnished and broken. Deep down, I knew it could never be revived like a phoenix rising from the ashes. All I could wish for is the possibility of friendship in the future. Amidst the pain and destruction, I fervently prayed that some good would eventually emerge from this experience. For the following six months, I awaited the finality of our marriage much like I did in the period leading up to it. I immersed myself in my work and hobbies. Nancy would occasionally call or visit the studio for conversation. Despite the absence of angry accusations, there was a noticeable gap between us, acknowledged by both parties. More uncomfortable were encounters with her parents or friends, who expressed dismay over Nancy's behavior and attempted to offer me solace. Interestingly, some of her close friends subtly hinted at providing additional comfort, notably Julie Howington. Nancy's lifelong best friend. While Julie was undoubtedly attractive, I wisely refrained from getting involved. A scorned woman is formidable enough, but a scorned redhead is even more daunting and not to be trifled with lightly. The true source of my healing had been right in front of me all along. Yes, you guessed it, Carrie Wilson. Since the very beginning of the turmoil, she had been a lifesaver. Without her, I dread to think what would have happened to both my business and me. She was not just a reliable and compassionate friend, but also a trustworthy confidant, always offering clear and beneficial advice. The turning point came on the day my marriage was set to officially end. Carrie was supposed to manage the studio while I dealt with the final legal proceedings. When she walked in that morning, I couldn't believe my eyes. Carrie always dressed well, but that day she seemed determined to lift my spirits by looking her absolute best, diverting my attention from self-pity to avoiding any potential misunderstandings. Her blonde hair was its usual straight, reaching down to the middle of her back. Her beautiful face wore minimal makeup, with just a touch of eyeliner and a light coat of red lipstick. But it was her attire that truly caught my attention. She wore a sleeveless red knit top that accentuated her cleavage, distracting enough to stir even the lifeless. I suspected the assistance of a push-up bra, though it hardly diminished the overall effect. Her black skirt hugged her figure, falling to mid-thigh, and her legs beneath it were breathtaking, clad in black nylon. Whether they were stockings or pantyhose was a detail I would have sacrificed much to know. Completing the ensemble were shiny black stiletto-heeled pumps adorning her dainty feet. Will I need to contact my attorney? She asked with a smile, adorning her dainty feet. Will I need to contact my attorney? I gazed up at her smiling face with a puzzled look of my own, clearly caught in a moment of intense desire. In my defense, it had been a while. If you show a starving man a perfectly cooked steak with all the fixings, his mouth is bound to water. What? I replied weakly. I asked if I'll need to call my lawyer. She still wore that adorable smile. To let him know my overly eager boss is eyeing me with unmistakable lust. Carrie, I protested, 
though my conviction was lacking. You just look different today. You caught me off guard, so you weren't mentally undressing me just now. She teased, that smug smile still intact. Okay, guilty as charged. I was enjoying the view. Are you going to keep teasing me about it? I'm just a regular guy going through a dry spell. You walk in here looking, I'll admit, quite appealing, and it grabbed my attention. Well, it's about time, she retorted energetically. I thought I might have to resort to something drastic, like stripping down to nothing by the end of the workday. It's called giving signals. Look it up. I know you've been stressed and preoccupied, but it's time to snap out of it. You're officially back on the market today, and I'm making my move now that you seem to be coming out of your shell at long last. To say I was shocked would be an understatement. I stood there, speechless and wide-eyed. Well, 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 aren't us blondes supposed to be the clueless ones, she remarked, crossing her arms provocatively under her charming smile. Guys can be so oblivious sometimes. I often wonder how you manage to get through an average day. I've been into you since day one although I managed to keep that hidden even from myself. I'm not one to wreck a home. Marriage holds meaning for me, despite how loosely the rest of the world may interpret it. Anyway, I can forgive your lack of awareness while you were married. In fact, if you had shown any inclination towards me during that time, I would have been out of here immediately, despite my feelings. But these past six months I've tried everything short of physically shaking you to get you to see that I'm not just a friend. I've been terrified one of Nancy's flirty friends would snatch you away. So are we going to give dating a shot and see if it leads to marriage and those six kids you always tease me about? Or are you going to break my heart? Carrie, I don't think that's a good idea, I replied sadly, watching her expression fall. Three kids will do just fine, she retorted, her tone a mix of disappointment and amusement. You jerk, she exclaimed happily, throwing herself into my arms. Within a year, Carrie and I tied the knot. Once I realized the truth, it seemed inevitable. Carrie possessed everything Nancy lacked. I trusted her implicitly, more than I ever did with Nancy. In many aspects, Carrie suited me far better than Nancy ever did. Our shared hobbies and interests strengthened our bond. Currently, we're planning a book featuring our artistic photos. Even sexually, she exceeded my expectations. Surprisingly, Carrie was a virgin when we started our intimacy. Despite her lack of experience, her enthusiasm compensated for it. Her physique was stunning, simultaneously petite and voluptuous. She responded eagerly to my touch, kisses, and every affectionate gesture. She was open to exploring anything I suggested, including the more adventurous aspects of our intimacy. Introducing her to the foot fetish that Nancy introduced to our relationship was a pleasant surprise. Carrie embraced it wholeheartedly. Like me, her focus was solely on pleasing each other without the need for any outside involvement. With each passing day, she helps heal the wounds Nancy left behind. We eagerly anticipate starting a family together. I have no doubt she'll be an exceptional mother. I am committed to showing her, through both words and actions, that she is the love of my life. This dedication will continue until my last breath. Regarding Nancy, we never developed the kind of friendship one might expect. In fact, she had left town shortly before Carrie and I got married. Nancy's mother candidly explained to me that her departure was motivated by two main factors. Firstly, her reputation had undoubtedly suffered a blow after the scandal came to light, leaving her feeling perpetually shattered by it. Secondly, and more pointedly, her mother revealed that Nancy's departure was largely influenced by me. Nancy herself acknowledged her missteps and harbored a desperate hope for a second chance. But witnessing my deepening love for Carrie proved agonizing for her, while she might have been able to endure the fallout from the scandal. If she had me by her side, it became evident to her that such a scenario was unlikely. Consequently, she sought a fresh start in Tennessee, securing a promising job as she endeavored to rebuild her life. I sincerely conveyed to her mother my well wishes for Nancy to find love and happiness, emphasizing that I held no grudges and forgave her completely. Naturally, my narrative wouldn't be fully recounted without acknowledging Mr. Ferris, would it? Unfortunately, fate dealt him a harsh hand. He was racing home one night on his hefty Harley, 
mere minutes away from his residence, cruising down the access road to his secluded property. Tragically, he never spotted the steel cable, its black coating blending into the night, positioned precisely at the level of his upper chest and neck. When his body collided with the unforgiving ground, his second and third cervical vertebrae snapped, claiming David Ferris's life instantly. Despite the thorough investigations by the authorities and medical examiner, the cable remained undiscovered, and his demise was deemed an accident. How, then, do I possess knowledge of the cable's existence? I'll tactfully invoke my right against self-incrimination on that matter. As for Libby Fielding, she mysteriously vanished shortly after Mr. Ferris's tragic end. Her whereabouts remain a puzzle to this day, yet I suspect her husband or his siblings might hold some answers. I can only hope her disappearance isn't linked to those photographs anonymously left in her husband's truck cab. Once more, I'll abstain from further comment. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.